Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What a wonderful day. The autumn has arrived. Are you happy? Yes. <laughs> Hopefully 90 degree weather is gone. Yes. For, you know, I'd be happy with you know, 10, 11 months. <laughs> um, Not me. <laughs> no, no. So, okay, we can do nine months. Just for you. Um, I want to continue uh, with giving thanks. As a matter of fact, in the next couple weeks, we'll be touching on uh, being the thankful people. Uh, we're speaking specifically in the community here, and I'm, I'm probably going to embarrass her, and she's already in a tough spot. But, um, Sally, if you would stand up real quick so everybody can see you. Um, dear Miss Sally takes care of our food pantry. Um, she always makes sure that when people are in need, they have what is necessary. And, and beyond that, I, I don't think we've ever had a work day at the church that Sally hasn't been here. Um, my, we were painting and siding last year, and I come around the side of the building, and there's Sally up on a ladder that's at about a 40-degree angle, <laughs> scraping. You had me scared, Sally. <laughs> but we want to say thank you for all of your hard work. Amen. And on that note, I'm going to ask Sally if she would come up and share her testimony. That's my favorite song. Thank you. <laughs> Me too. Um, that's what I'm looking forward to. And I need them face to face. Mm -hmm. Those who don't know you, my name is Sally Hart, and I was born and raised in Southern California with my two older brothers, my dad and my grandmother. This is so hard. <laughs> I remember going to Sunday school at a young age and looking forward to each Sunday. Although I grew up in the church, I really didn't understand the message of the gospel. It seemed like separate stories to me. Uh, but I know I love the Lord. I love the man. And I do feel like I had an encounter with Jesus that I never forgot. I was crying about something that I can't even remember what it was. At that age, little girls are very, very emotional. And I still am. <laughs> Through my tears, I saw the brightest light and a blurred figure. And I knew it was Jesus. He was smiling and spreading out his arms. It was like an invitation to come to him. The joy and warmth I felt at that moment is beyond words. I wish I could say it changed my life at that time, but as I grew and got into high school and left for college, I stopped going to church. I graduated from college, married someone I met there. And nine years later, I was divorced with two young daughters to raise by myself. Melanie, seven years, and Kathy, at three years of age. I don't wish that on anyone. It was a hard life for all of us. At that time, I was working at the Cancer Detection Center downtown LA, 60 miles away, round trip. And I went to real estate school at night to get my license and be closer to home. There was a lot of drinking with the agents, and I fell into that trap at my daughter's expense. I brought this. <laughs> anyway. Things turned upside down for all of us at that time. I kept trying to get my girls under control and I saw they were headed down the wrong road. And it broke my heart because they were the most important thing in my life. I was beside myself, how can I fix them? That's when I heard a whisper. How can you fix them when you are the one that's broken? 
And I knew whose voice that was. Well, it didn't happen overnight. But I started going to Calvary Chapel in Torrance under Steve Mays every Sunday night. Well, every Sunday and nights when I could. And started reading my Bible every chance. And I gave my heart to, uh, and life to the Lord and was born again in Him and He in me. My daughter Kathy started going to church with her friends after that and is an awesome woman of God, married to Scott, an awesome man of God, with three married children and three spouses, all walking with the Lord, and all awesome people of God. God is so good. I also have another granddaughter, Ella, and most of you know her, who loves the Lord and belongs to Him. We are still all praying for Ella's mom, Melanie, Floyd, and her sister, Athena, to come to the Lord. I have no doubt they will have their story in time to come, because the Lord won't, because the Lord won't give up on them, nor will we. Amen. God is so faithful. God's word through Isaiah says, 118, Come now, and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they um, be like crimson, they shall be as wool. I thank my God that he forgives completely, as far as the east is from the west. And make this a new creation in him. He is truly my hero. Thank you, Sally. Um, can anybody tell me where we are? I know, I know, Montana. I mean the scripture. <laughs> Colossians! You guys are quick. Colossians chapter 3. If you would turn there with me. Last week we kind of concluded our overview, looking at what I wanted to discuss and what we're going to discuss over the next couple weeks. And I need to share with you, um, right at the start, there's, there's some heavy things. If your heart is open, there are heavy things that we're going to be discussing today. Because this is what we are called to. This is the nature that we should have if Christ's Spirit lives in us. Okay? This is what exudes out from us. We talked last week a little bit uh, about the fruit being uh, attached. It only grows when it's attached to the vine. Life flows from the vine and Jesus is the vine. Know, and, and our lives are the branches and the fruit that comes out of that is what we're going to be talking about. Now, the thing is, when we talk about these, our measure is always Jesus Christ. Okay? And he's perfect. So what I want to say to you right now is don't despair if you're not there yet. Okay? Because uh, Peter tells us when he goes through and he lists the fruit, he talks about these things in increasing measure. If you have these, and in increasing measure. Okay? We are looking at the end picture, understanding that each of us is at different points along the path to getting to that end picture. Okay? So, when you are looking at this, the measure is Jesus Christ and it reflects on your life. But the way you measure your life is not here to eternity. It's where have I come from up to this point? And where do I need to go? So we're looking for growth. Okay? You don't plant a grapevine and go out the next day and expect to see grapes. Okay? There's a process whereby the vine grows the branch, the branch grows the fruit. The fruit will ripen, and then it will come into maturity, and then it's useful. So I just want to encourage you, when we're talking about these things, we're going to be talking about the end result. 
and, and we're not there yet. And I, I dare say nobody here is there yet because we're not perfect. Okay? So, a um, couple things. Where I'm going to start. I'm just going to read the passage again. Always good to read the passage. Um, we're in chapter 3 of Colossians. I'm going to read in verse 12. It says, Put on then, and we already talked about why is the then there, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Okay? So you, you realize you're called, you're set apart, and He loves you dearly. Okay? That's an exciting thing. Okay? You, you are separate and loved. Now we put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, in which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. That's the end picture. That's where we're going, folks. That's where we're going. Okay? And what we're doing now is we're learning what that looks like. You know, I, I've read this passage. I, I typically read through all of Scripture at least once a year. Okay? But you know... I know you people don't have to suffer from the same problems that I do. But a lot of times when I'm reading scripture and I get to a familiar passage, I kind of blank out. And I, I, my eyes see the words, but a lot of times they don't really take root because I've already read it and I know it and I'm just kind of moving on. And, and I confess that when I first started Colossians, I, I kind of glanced through this. I thought this would be a, hey man, I, man, I could probably do you know, six, seven verses a week on this one because you know, we all know this thing. And, and uh, I confess when I started looking into it, I really didn't have a good picture of what this looks like. Okay, uh, Think about this for a minute. What is a compassionate heart? What is a compassionate heart? A merciful heart. A merciful heart. Okay, well, it's a merciful heart, but now we've just exchanged compassionate for merciful. What does it mean, though? How does that play out? What does it look like in this life? Okay, I, I got two ears, <laughs> but I only have one brain. <laughs> what was that, Mary Lou? To feel someone else's pain. To feel someone else's pain? I heard something over here. To put someone else's feelings above yours. To put someone else's feelings above yours. Okay. Now, I want to caution you. Because he's calling us to a lifestyle, not to a moment. Okay? Now, going back, I, I looked up in the Greek. You know, all of these words, what is a Greek word for this? I mean, and quite honestly, it doesn't mean anything to you. Because what I would do is I would tell you the Greek word, and then I'd just go right back and say, this is what they translate that to. But I did come across a couple of interesting things. The first thing that really surprised me is when I looked at a compassionate heart. Now, heart, you know, they're not talking about this organ that... Dub, 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 or... Or... Me. Okay, they're not talking about the physical organ... <laughs> Okay, right? What they're talking about is the center of emotion. And, you know, it, it's different because different cultures have different beliefs as to where the center of emotion is. Some of them it's the liver. You know, others it's the gut, the intestines. Um, but but it, it's talking about the location of, of where our, 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 our feelings are. Okay? The compassionate heart. But what's interesting about it is the word compassionate there is actually in the masculine form. Okay? Now, quite honestly, when I read these traits, <coughs> compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, I think of moms. I do. Um, I don't think of dads. I think of moms. You know, I, I think of dads as, as the providers and the disciplinarians and, and the, you know, kind of the rugged individualists. But when I, when I look at these, I, I, I see mom. And I see moms in general. You know, compassionate hearts. 
You know, when the kids are up at 3 o'clock in the morning throwing up in the bathroom, it's mom's compassionate heart that goes in and cleans it up. It's dad's weak stomach that keeps him out of the bathroom. Okay? Yeah, that's personally. How do you, I know you guys don't have weak stomachs. But, you know, when they're in there heaving up, I don't go there. And so far in 26 years of being married, there's only been two occasions where they've done that when she was not home. <laughs> And it's two more occasions than I appreciate. <laughs> but this word, compassionate, is the masculine form of the Greek word, not the feminine form. It's talking about men. Now, women, don't go, oh good, I'm off the hook. Because every other word that he uses here is in the feminine form. Now, men, don't think, oh good, I only got one. Because Paul is speaking to all of us. And he's trying to lay out before us what a life filled with God's Spirit should look like. This is a gauge whereby we are able to determine, where am I at in Christ? Am I in Christ? Am I in Christ? Okay? You know, it's, it's really kind of a funny thing because if you ask someone how they know they're a Christian, a lot of times they get, well, I go to church, well, I do good deeds, well, I, I pray the sinner's prayer, in VBS when I was six years old, but, but really the measure is here, right? You will know them by their VBS confession? No. <laughs> you know, their church attendance? No. Because you will know them by their fruit, by that that grows out from them, okay? Uh, you look at that, especially in the New Testament, you see over and over and over again comparisons and contrasts between the works of the flesh, the works of a life not led by God, and the works of a life filled with His Holy Spirit. Okay, the most famous is in Galatians chapter 5. Okay, but you see them over and over again, and they use all different kinds of, of contrasts. They talk about, you know, the wheat and the weeds, the sheep and the goats, and the, the fruit and the thorns, and the salt water and the fresh water. But the, the, the point is, they're different. And we shouldn't have a problem determining which is which. You know, if I hand you a glass of water, I guarantee you it wouldn't take you much more than eat to know if it was salt or fresh. Well, some of you. Some of you, I'm not sure. <laughs> I've seen some of the things you eat. I, I don't know if they're taste buds. Okay. But it, 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 it should be obvious, shouldn't it? Okay, so a compassionate heart. Now, what I've done is I've looked at Two different approaches to this. I look at what the world says. You know, if you go out and talk to uh, Joe Schmo out on the street, and I, I've got their opinion on what this should look like, okay? And the dictionary defines uh, compassion as sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings or misfortunes of others. Okay? being kind of weird, I, I, that wasn't good enough for me, so I, I wanted to know the etymology of the word. Where does compassion come from? And it's a Latin word, okay? And C-O-M, com, means with, okay? So like companion, it means with bread. You, you share bread, okay? Bread sharers. So companion or company, you share bread. <laughs> compassion, Come passes, passes is to share struggle, to, to, be, to be with someone in their struggles. Okay? So, okay, we have a working definition. Well, compassion, you know, to be with someone in their struggles, to share with their struggles. Okay? And I wanted to see what the world had to say about this. So, I, I looked up just some quotes online. Just, I just Google. Google knows everything and nothing. <laughs> it's an enigma. Arthur Jersel, I don't know who he is, but he quoted, this is a quote from him, so don't go, oh, oh he didn't do proper etiquette in his speechifying because he didn't give credit to this guy. I don't know who he is, but if you ever say this and he's like, hey, I said that, I'm telling you now, he said it. Okay? <laughs> Compassion is the ultimate and most meaningful embodiment of emotional maturity. It is through compassion that a person achieves the highest peak and deepest reach in his or her search for self-fulfillment. God, you humanist. 
What a load of hockey. I'm feeling for you so I can be complete. Because really, it's not about you, it's about me. I'm trying to fulfill self. I'm sorry, but that's the bullpucky. Isn't that just like the world? In order to appear uh, benign, in order to appear good, I'm going to phrase everything really neat so it looks like it's about you, but really it's about me. Because I'm going to go through this with you so that I can be fulfilled. Compassion means, I don't know who said this, this was just something on there, they didn't credit the person. It says compassion means having true empathy for another human being. I got a problem with this. What does empathy mean? Do you know the difference between empathy and sympathy besides a couple letters? Do you know what it means, the difference is? Okay, sympathy, I have not been in your shoes, but I, I, I feel for you. Empathy, I've been there. I've worn those shoes. Therefore, I know what you're going through. Whereas on sympathy, I haven't been there, but I sympathize. I, I feel for you. Over here, I've been there, and I know what you're going through. How in the world can I empathize with all of you? I haven't been through what you've been through. I don't know. I don't know what your lives were like. You know, uh, quite honestly, People that struggle with alcohol, I don't get it because I don't like alcohol. Okay, I just, I never got it. It's like, Pepsi, okay? So I, I don't get it. So I can't empathize with someone that struggles with alcohol. Now I can sympathize because I struggle with other things, but I can't empathize. So how in the world, now let me read this again and see if you guys agree with me. Compassion means having true empathy for another human being. Not even twins share every experience. One other one. Compassion means a feeling of deep sorrow and sympathy for someone who has had a hardship or misfortune. It usually includes a desire to make things all better. Okay. I, I, I kind of I see this. Keeping in mind that this person doesn't have God's Spirit living in them to enable to do this properly. Mm -hmm. They, they kind of get the picture. They're, they're, it's kind of like, um, you know, the difference between um, a kindergartner's painting and Monet. Or Rembrandt. Okay, I'm going to do Rembrandt because I like his paintings better. Okay. I mean, I look at Rembrandt and, you know, there's just a difference between a painting and a picture. And, and Rembrandt, I look at and I just think, what a marvelous talent and ability. Now, I, I know I'm going to embarrass her, but um, uh, this, this girl over here in the pink sweatshirt. Christy <laughs> Kern is one of the most incredible artists I've ever met personally. I mean, she, she's put things on paper that just amaze me. It's a talent that just fascinates me. Because I can't draw a straight line. I, you know, even if I try to draw a curvy line, I do it wrong. <laughs> okay. But, but the difference between what they're saying is like, giving Titus the big crayon and turning him loose. You know, it, it's there, but it's not there. So I wanted to look, you know, that's what the world has to say about this. And I want to look at what God has to say about this, because ultimately, this is all truth. Now, it's not all the truth universal, it's all the truth we need. Right? Yes. Okay, let me explain that for those of you that don't understand what I'm saying. This has everything in it that we need, but it doesn't have everything in it. John in his gospel writes on, I believe on two occasions, he says, you know, if we were to put down everything he did, there wouldn't be enough paper in the world to do it. Well, did Jesus do something we don't know about? Yes, that's truth. We don't have it in here because we don't need it. What's in here is what we need. So I want to go back and I wanted to look at what God had to say about compassionate heart in his word. Okay? So, we're going to kind of bop around a little bit. Because, you know, God's all throughout this. So, the Hebrew word, both Hebrew and Greek, and they, they run very close in parallel for the words that they use for compassion. It means literally to have mercy, to feel sympathy, and to have pity. 
Okay? Notice it doesn't say anything about empathy. God's not requiring that you go through it in order to understand it. Okay? Added bonus if you have. Added bonus if you have because then you can relate to somebody that's actually going through it. Is God compassionate? Flip over real quick. We're going to bounce around. Psalm 86.15. Kind of funny. I was reading out of that psalm this morning. Now, depending on your translation, it may translate these words a little bit differently. Um, my translation, we're starting in Psalm 86, verse 15, says, But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. In other translations, it says, compassionate. <coughs> compassionate. You are God of compassion. Uh, lamentation. I'm going to flip over. You guys don't have to bounce with me. I, I'll, I'll try and uh, go a little bit quicker so we're not having to wait on everyone. Lamentations chapter 3. Starting in verse 22. It says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. You know, you see the word mercy there? It's the same <coughs> compassion. Okay? Did you catch what it says here? I mean, this is, this is really, really cool. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. It never ends. His mercies never come to an end. His compassion never comes to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. See, God is compassionate. God is compassionate. He's full of mercy. Now, if you want to talk about sympathy versus empathy, how can God, who has never experienced sin, therefore has never experienced the result of sin, empathize with us in our plight? Well, he became man, came down and suffered every temptation known to man, overcame them all, so he knows what life is like on this earth. And having a heart full of compassion, he made a way for us to get out. Okay? We're going to have to look at a couple more things. Because see, now we've talked about God the Father, but you know, Jesus Christ. Um, Lazarus. Okay? Lazarus. I love the story of Lazarus, but it, it really kind of befuddles me. It really does. Because Jesus is off, and a messenger comes and says, Hey, your friend Lazarus is sick. And Jesus goes, Okay. No, I mean, like, really sick. Okay. No, I, you don't understand. Like, probably not going to recover. Sick. Yeah, okay, I got it. And then he tarries for a while. He lingers. He hangs out for a while. And after a couple days, he tells us, hey, you know what? We're going to go see Lazarus. He's fallen asleep. And they're like, that's what sick people do. That's how they get better. Leave him alone. You know? He says, no, you don't understand. He's, he's, he's dead. Oh, we're going to a funeral. Okay. Got it. Now, I love the story, but I don't understand. This is God. I mean, we know of cases where he healed people without even being there. The centurion's servant. The centurion showed faith such as Jesus had never seen in all of Israel. Said, no, you, it, I am unworthy to have you enter my house. Just say the word, and I know he'll be healed. Jesus said the word, and, and from that very moment, the servant was healed. Jesus didn't need to go there. Jesus could have stayed where he was and said, oh yeah, okay, he's healed. And Lazarus would have, boop, up and gone about his business. Okay? Jesus goes and he meets Martha and then Mary and they go to the tomb 
And how long had Lazarus been in the tomb? Can anyone tell me? Four days. Four days. Four days. Now that's interesting. Now, you know, you take this with a grain of salt. Some of the reading that I've done kind of indicates that the Jewish custom, the Jewish belief was that for three days the soul would linger around the body. Okay. So for someone to be resurrected in that three days was not really a big deal because it's just like saying, oh, soul, get back in there. But on the fourth day, the soul would depart. Okay? And so, you know, I don't know if that's why that's in there, but it's significant it's in there because it's in there. He said four days. So Jesus goes and he says, hey, um, roll that stone away. Now, they don't have embalming. They've got spices. Little paprika. <laughs> little, you know. I mean, they're, they're packing spices in to overwhelm the stench. Okay? But he's been sealed up for four days, and the spices are probably not doing anything at this point. So it stinks. And he, Jesus said, open that up. Uh, God? Jesus? <laughs> it stinks in there. The, the odor is going to be bad. I mean, this, this is long past open casket. It's got to be done. No, just roll it away. And then speaking with the voice of God, he says, Lazarus, come out. Now, there's one thing in there that I want to point out to you. Can anyone tell me what the shortest verse in the Bible is? Ah. You know that it says that Jesus was moved. Jesus was compassionate. He saw them grieving. He saw them hurting. And he wept. He wept. Do you realize that's what the body of Christ is called to do? To weep with those who weep, to mourn with those who mourn, to rejoice with those who rejoice? We're, we're called to do that. And, and we have an example of it in the Gospel of John. Jesus went and... and, and now, think about this for a minute. Jesus knew what was going to happen. I mean, why is he crying? He knows Lazarus is going to be... I think it's because he had a compassionate heart. And when they hurt, he hurt. You know, and, and a couple of verses prior to that, it says Jesus was upset. I think at that point, he's not upset like emotionally he's going to cry. I think at that point, he's mad because of their lack of faith. But in this one, it says he was moved. And he wept. Okay, We see the compassionate heart of Jesus in that moment. Now, Quite honestly, you follow the story through, things didn't look so good for Lazarus after he was resurrected, did they? Why? What happened? <laughs> yeah. In order to discredit the miracle of Jesus, the Pharisees want to kill him. Come out of the grave, and you've got a marker on you. They're taking out a contract on his life. Because the, the Pharisees, the rulers, need to discredit Jesus. But that's another story. We'll get to that in a little while. Another year or so. So, um, Matthew chapter 14. There's another example that I want to share with you. Okay. Um, this is the, the feeding of the 5,000. Okay, so starting in verse 13, I'm going to read. Uh, Matthew 14, verse 13 says, Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there to, in a boat to a desolate place by himself. When the crowd started, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. See, the thing that I want you to pick up is see, it's not just enough that, that you feel bad. Because Jesus didn't just feel bad. There's always an action that was spurred on as a result of the compassion. As a matter of fact, uh, in James, the book of James and in 1 John, there's a, a sharp reproof for us about compassion. You see, in James... Um, it talks about the brother that shows up at the door that is in need and warns us not to send them away if we have means to fulfill that need. John had even go so far as to say that if you see your brother in need and do nothing to help him, 
The love of God is not in you. Ouch. Ouch. See, this is the nature of a compassionate heart. It's not enough to just be sympathetic. The sympathy has to move you to action. The sympathy has to move you to action. We're not called to be gelatinous masses of emotional upheaval that parts our rumps in a chair and feels a lot of things. Okay? We're called to action. We are called to be a people of action. Sometimes that action is getting on our faces before God and lifting them up in prayer. Sometimes it's getting out and doing. But you should never be immobilized. You should never be inactive. Okay? It should never be enough to just be aware of what's going on. It should always move you to some action. Okay? So, keeping in mind, let's go back to what I said at the start. We're not there perfectly. We're there increasingly. The measure is Christ, a compassionate heart. This is what we are looking for. This is one of the fruits that Paul is laying out before us. This is what being a Christian looks like. When you become a Christian, wham! You get stamped with the seal of His Spirit. You have His Spirit in you. Everything that you need that pertains to life and godliness is given you. And your life must of necessity change. Right? It has to change. Okay? So, if it's changing, this is what it should change to. Got it? Got it? Yep. Some of us have buds. Some of us have clusters. And some of us are just now starting to show a little green. That's okay. Keep growing. Okay? Don't look around and go, Oh gosh, I just got a twig with a leaf on it. I better quit. No, let that leaf grow. And open up the floodgates and let, it, let his life fill you up so that you can start bearing fruit. Don't be frustrated with where you're at today. Because he hasn't called you to be at the end at the moment. Okay? We'll get to the end. Don't worry about that. All those songs we sang this morning. By the way, thank you very much for that worship set this morning. Yeah. I don't know about you guys, but that just it really blessed me. Yeah. I mean, think about this for a moment. I know this is going to be a problem. I'm, I'm deviating. Rabbit trail. All right? If Jesus' return is not the greatest expectation in your life, there is something seriously lacking in your life. Mm -hmm. Okay? If you are really looking at something as shallow as anything that this life has to offer as being a greater expectation than His return, you really don't understand what His return is all about. And really, you don't understand the, the illusory things that this life has to offer. Mm -hmm. And I say that understanding, look, I really want to get married. I love my wife. And I think for the most part, our marriage is absolutely fantastic now. Keeping in mind, I'm comparing it to where it came from. And I know it's going to get even better. But quite honestly, if I have to choose between him coming back and an even better marriage, I want him to come back. <coughs> I want him to come back. Examine your motives of your heart. Because, man, when we were singing those songs this morning, I'm almost in tears. Man, the, the, the wrapping up of this testimony to us is, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Come quickly. So I challenge you, examine. Really hold into the light of God's Word and the light of the Spirit. What is the most important thing to you? Okay? So... We're going to move on to kindness. Because in Colossians, that's the next thing. It says compassionate hearts. <clears throat> kindness. i got to tell you, I struggle with this. I really do. Because kindness, feel free to disagree with me. I, I, I disagree with myself. But when... I really, I just kind of go along with these kindnesses I see as a feminine emotion, a feminine action. 
and I struggle with kindness because I'm not really sure how to be kind. I, I struggle with that with my kids because I, you know, my job is to toughen them up. You can't toughen them up by being kind. Mom's job is to blow up their heads about what a great kid they are and my job is to deflate it so they come back to reality. Okay? And I struggle with kindness because I'm not really sure how to do that. Okay? So I, I'm, I'm being honest with you here. So kindness. What is kindness? Let's, let's take a look. Let's get a working definition of kindness. Okay? Um, the dictionary says it's an adjective. Woohoo! Hey, you excited? I don't care. Uh, it's an adjective. Having or showing a gentle nature and a desiring to help others. Wanting and liking to do good things and to bring happiness to others. Okay. We we'll go to the etymology. I can't even say the word because it's, it's old English. Um, so I'm not even going to try. But it, it, the word is, uh, the, the literal word means natural, native, or innate. But the idea behind it is um, with the feeling... <coughs> Of relative to others, being a part of something other than yourself. So it's kind of very similar to compassion, but it, it kind of goes beyond just a compassionate heart because whereas compassion, a compassionate heart, we can see just by the translation, the definition, well, that's kind of more of a, a feeling based thing and doesn't really require some action. Kindness requires us to action. Now, like I said, in looking at what how compassion plays out in the New Testament, I see that it requires us to action. But there's no way you can get out of kindness without action of some sort. Okay? So, um, how does kindness play out in Scripture? Well, first, you know, the, the, the word, uh, the, the Greek word is kreistotas. Okay? And it literally means moral goodness, integrity, and kindness. It can, be, it can be used in any one of those ways. So, how do we look at kindness in Scripture? Now, the, the interesting thing that I found about this is, what's 1 Corinthians 13? Love. The love chapter. Okay? This is the chapter where we get probably the best description, the best working definition of what love should look like. Now, in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul starts off by talking about, okay, we have to love each other, and this is what it looks like. Now, in, in Colossians chapter 3, he's going through all the descriptors and ends up, above all these things, put on love. Okay? They, they go hand in glove. They, you, you can't really separate them. God's Word doesn't allow us to separate them. You can't act out of kindness and not love. Okay? And you can't really love someone and not be kind. Do you, do you see that? Now, keep in mind, kind isn't being mushy, milk chocolatey. Okay? It's not just, oh, I know you're doing wrong, but I love you anyway, and gosh, I hope you just don't hurt yourself. It's like saying, no. Hey, look, that's wrong. That's leading to death. You can't continue in that. Okay? Uh, it's, so we have such a difficult time with that, don't we? Because we vacillate between one extreme and the other. The one indicates that really there is no problem with your sin. And the other is there is no resolution to your sin. You're just lousy. You're rotten meat. Okay? And, and neither of those is the way that Jesus has laid things out. Hey, think about this for a minute. Okay? The Pharisees, the leaders, are trying to trap him. And they bring a woman caught in adultery to him. Okay? Now, there's a couple of things in this story that I want to point out to you. First, where's the dude? Because the law of Moses says both of them are taken outside and stoned. Not just the girl. They caught her in the act of adultery. Where's the dude? I don't know. I don't need to know because it's not in there. That's just one of those things that I scratch my head about. <laughs> Two. 
Jesus writes in the sand, says he who is not committed to sin, cast the first stone. He writes in the sand again, and they leave from oldest to youngest. Now, I've shared with some of you what I think happened. I'll share with the rest of you. I think Jesus wrote down the names and the dates they visited the one. And I think they went, ooh. And they left. Ah, I could be wrong. That's fine. I'm speculating. It's idle speculation. That, that, I mean, if I knew what was going on and he wrote my name down, I'm out of there. But you see, the, the thing that happens is after everybody's left, Jesus does an interesting thing. He talks to the woman. Now, do you know what a problem that is? He's talking with a woman that was caught in adultery. I mean, really, what's there to say besides duck? <laughs> and he's talking to her. And he says, woman, who condemns you? And she says, no one, sir. He says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, isn't that interesting? Because was Jesus being kind there? Mm -hmm. Oh, you betcha he was being kind. I mean, what a marvelous picture of him being kind. But was he being mushy, milk, chocolatey, smush? No, because he, he lays down before her. No, I don't condemn you, but quit doing this. You've got to stop. Okay? Think again. We have another example. The, the Samaritan woman. Okay? Jesus is at the well. Mm -hmm. The disciples are going to get food. The woman comes to the well. And Jesus talks to her. Okay? We don't understand what that means. Because there's a couple of problems culturally here. One, she's a woman. Okay, he says, give me something to drink. That's possible. But that puts him in a really awkward spot because he's talking to a woman that's not his relative. Two, she's a Samaritan. The Jews didn't even pass through Samaria. They would go around because of their disgust with that people. Now, you guys know what the Samaritans are, right? Why there's a problem with that? Little history lesson, all right? When the Jews were exiled and they went to, uh, the Assyrians scattered them and then the Babylonians came and took them. Um, the way the Assyrians did things is in order to keep peace, they would take the entire group of people and they'd scatter them throughout their empire, okay? In, in fairly small groups. It's kind of hard to arrange an uprising when 90% of the people around you don't speak your language. <laughs> okay? And so, when the Assyrians departed, uh, they brought, or they, they sent the, the Jews away, they brought in people from other cultures, and they, they, those that were left, they intermarried. And their lineage is no longer pure. So when the Jews come back from the exile of Babylon, there's this whole group of people here who have no genealogical record of being pure Jews. Now, intermarriage was not necessarily a problem because we see in Scripture that there were other people that they married. But they had no way to prove their genealogy. They could not come to the temple to worship. The Jews wanted nothing to do with them. Can you think leper? They were cultural lepers. These were people that were, as far as the Jews were concerned, they're, they're doing this baloney worship of our God and they're getting it all wrong they're perverting it we're the pure ones so Jesus is talking to this woman and he shares with her things that he shouldn't know do you think Jesus is showing kindness in that moment mm -hmm. yeah I mean the disciples come back and they're like what's he doing talking to her what is going on They don't get it. Okay? But I want to show you a couple scriptures. I want to show you a couple scriptures here. Um, uh, Romans chapter 2. Sorry, I got off my notes and I had to catch back up. Romans chapter 2. Check this out. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. 
So I'm, I'm going to back up. Uh, I'm going to start from one, but verse four is really what I want to talk about. Um, number, verse one, chapter two says, "Therefore, you have no excuse, O man. Every one of you who judges, from passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man?" You who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourselves, that you will escape the judgment of God? Now check this out. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Did you get that? Because God is kind and he brings us to repentance. Why? Because he wants better for us than what we can provide for ourselves. It's God's kindness that does this. God's kindness that does this. Now let's look, let's look a little bit further in, in Romans. We're going to go uh, flip over to Romans chapter 11. So it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. <clears throat> Now we're in, in chapter 11, and he's talking about Israel and the Gentiles. And um, verse 21, chapter 11, verse 21 says, For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. He's talking about their, their unbelief, uh, the natural branches being the Jews. We are the ingrafted branches, the wild branches. Okay? And he says, if their unbelief caused him to be separated, what makes you think he's going to keep you in it with your unbelief? But he said, now, catch this. Verse 22. Note, then, the kindness and the severity of God. Severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. Check that out. Not only is it his kindness that calls us, it's his kindness that sustains us. Mm -hmm. It's his kindness that keeps us. Now, see, this, this is kind of shaking me up a little bit when I'm doing my study here because I'm having to rethink how I view kindness. I mean, gosh, I guess if it's good enough for God, it should be good enough for me, right? Right? Right. So if it's good enough for God and it's good enough for me, it should be good enough for you, right? Okay, just get me out of there. If it's good enough for God, it should be good enough for you, right? Right. Okay, so now we have this, we're called to not just be compassionate, but we're called to be kind, and this is something that is to be put into action. Let's, let's go a little bit further. Um, Mm, uh, okay, that's where I got off. Uh, going back to 1 John. Okay, don't even bother turning there. I'll just read it for you. John 3, 17, 1 John 3.17 says, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Okay, well, let's, let's go forward a few. 1 John 4.20 it says, if anyone says, I love God, but hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. See, the thing is, why is it so important to God that we have these, these groups? Why is it, I mean, obviously it is, because he lists them out several times in his word. Why is it important for him to, to show us what we should look like? He wants us to be like him. I mean, between a muddled up, messed up mess and perfection, what would you choose? I mean, you already have. You're a Christian. You've chosen perfection. Now, he's called us to maturity as well. Okay, see, the, the thing is, you can't come into Christ with Christ just as your Savior. Okay? Because, see, when you come into Christ, you, you have to acknowledge him as Lord. And he, you know, a Christian, the term Christian, what does that mean? Christ. Christ. Little Christ. Uh, no, it means little Christ. Mm -hmm. It was an insult. Okay, it was originally an insult. 
Because, you know, the Jews and the, the people around, they see these, 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 at that point, they were called the Nazarene sect. Because Jesus was from Nazareth, and, and they called him the Nazarene sect. So, they, they started going, oh, oh, look, there goes one of those you know, Christians, those little Christ people. Because they believed in the, the, the Messiah had returned. The Christ had returned. Christ literally just means the anointed one. Okay, it's the Greek translation of the Jewish word Messiah. Okay, so when you hear Christ, it's meaning the anointed one, the one anointed of God to save the world from its sins. Okay? And when you are taking on the name of Christian, you are the little Christ. You are the, the imitator of him. Do you guys ever do that when you're a kid with your siblings? Play the repeat? Okay, they say something and you repeat it. Okay. I never did. God, that's a lie. But I had a, a sibling. I had two siblings that did. Oh, that was annoying. Oh, that was annoying. Would you please stop? Would you please stop? I'm going to tell mom. I'm going to tell mom. Mom! Mom! See, that's what we are supposed to be like. We are the imitators of Christ. Right? Because he's called us to be like him. Why? Why? Uh, isn't that perfect? Isn't that perfect? Why? Because we are the only thing that the world out there sees of Christ here. Right? We are his body put on this earth to function for him. So, in order to function for him, we have to clearly represent who he is. Right? right. And if we don't exhibit the same characteristics and the same attributes as him, how can we truly represent him? We can't. It's no wonder the world is so confused. Amen. Because they can pick this up and they can see what Jesus was like. They got four different gospels that tell his story. Four different biographies. And then they look at us. So caught up in our theological differences and our doctrine and our dogma that we can't even fellowship with people, you know, oh, you know, oh, that's, a, that's an Episcopal. You know, I mean, really. Really. Is it any wonder they don't want anything to do with him? when the only picture they have of him is us and we can't get it right? Let's go back to my original statement. Not perfectly, increasingly. Okay? Because this, this is heavy stuff. You can't just take this, put it in a bottle and stick it on the shelf. Okay? That leads to God's disappointment in you. Don't get me wrong. God loves you. He will always love you. But sometimes I think we do things that make him very unhappy with us. I think we hurt him. I think we grieve him. Okay? Make an endeavor to be more Christ-like. Again, you're plugged into the, the, the vine. The natural outgrowth of that should be these characteristics. You can't just get up in the morning today and say, oh, today I'm going to be kind. I'm going to be kind, I'm kind, hey, I'm kind, hey, how's it going? I'm kind, I'm kind, hey, I'm kind. It doesn't work that way. You can carry that off for a while. But I tell you what, man, when God is inside of you and his power is working in you, you can't help but be kind. So, like I said last week, get out of the way and let God work in you the changes. Okay? You can take off your kind badge, put it back on the shelf, and just let kindness exude out of you. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. Because, boy, I tell you what, it's a much better life. It's a much better life. Now, I'm, I'm still working on my kindness. Don't talk to my kids. <laughs> They'll tell you how far I've got to go. Okay? But I'm, you know, that's something that God has made me aware of. Okay, this is an area that you're weak in. All right, let's change it. Which really means let me change it. Okay? Mm -hmm.